again. So actually the main motivation of my talk is to advertise the work of one of my students. Uh, but since uh, I was told it's a colloquial talk, I will take most of the mo of my talk giving motivation and I will only arrive to this question at the end of the talk. But before I do that, let me write the name of the student. His name is Adolfo Guillaume. Okay, so uh, what am I going to speak about? I want to discuss differential equations in the complex domain. By this I mean, to simplify matters, equations like I, like I wrote, f of x, y, y prime is equal to zero, or maybe a, sec a second order differential equation, where f is, say, a polynomial with complex coefficients. And we look at solutions as being functions y of x satisfying these differential equations. Okay, so this is a very classical question. And as in any part of mathematics, we have to make a very big decision. What kind of objects are we looking at? Do we, look, do we want to look at the generic polynomial or do we look at very specific examples? You know, in any, kind, any part of mathematics, this is a very important decision. Uh, in Riemannian geometry, for example, do you want to understand the generic Riemannian manifold or do you want to look at uh, spheres? If you look at uh, uh, polyhedron, do you want to look at the random one or the icosahedron? This is the kind of thing we should look at. In dynamical system, Essentially, since Smear, we are used to think of dynamical system, or of interesting dynamical system as being a generic one. This is not the way people were thinking uh, in, during the 19th century. And I want to come back to this point of view. I'm not, I don't want to claim it's better than the classical point of view that we should look at tip, a typical dynamical system. But I want to emphasize that it might be a good way of working to try to pinpoint some very specific examples, some nice differential equations which are nicer than others. This is what I want to, this is the guiding principle of this talk. Okay, so I wrote here three very broad properties uh, which make differential equations in the complex domain interesting. Usually, solutions of differential equations in the complex domain are multivalued. Usually, they ramify, and usually they have movable singularity. I'm going to explain that in a moment. But this is really, to my point of view, this is the three main properties that we gain from complex numbers. You know, Pendleton used to say that in between two truths in the real domain, the shortest path, passes through the complex domain. Usually, if you, if you want to understand some phenomenon in the real domain, it might be a good idea to complexify the situation and you get some structure. So let me give you three very simple examples to show you what I mean by multivalued, ramification, and movable singularity. First, here are three examples of very simple differential equations in the complex domain, which come from uh, the original book of, uh, of Paluzé, uh, three main examples. First one is the linear one. x, y prime is equal to lambda y. Solution is y is constant times x to the lambda. So when lambda is a positive integer, it's fine. It's a holomorphic solution. <coughs> when lambda is a negative integer, it has a pole, so it's not so bad. When lambda is rational, it's already ramified, like root of, of, of x. But when lambda is irrational, it's a little bit worse. 
So we should be prepared to deal with functions which are not univalued, which are not, which are multivalued. Second example, y prime is equal to minus one half of y cubed has as a solution y is one divided by root of x minus c, where c is a constant. And you see that the main point here is that the solution has a ramification on the denominator at a point which depends on the solution. So this is what we mean by there is a movable singularity. In the first example, the singularity is always at zero, independently of the solution. In the second example, the singularity, which is not so terrible, just a usual ramification, but it's terrible in the sense that it's moving depending on the initial condition. And the third equation, which is a little bit more complicated to write down, is a second order differential equation uh, that you have on the left, and on the right you have the solution. And you see that this not only has a movable singularity, but it has a terrible movable singularity. Your log of one, uh, log of x is terrible, multivalued function. Okay. So somehow, one guiding principle, if one would like to understand, to pick some nice equations which are nicer than others, would be to try to avoid those terrible properties. So a guiding principle would be, let us try, what? You're right, you're right. It's Okay, the point is that this is, at, at, this is movable. This is at a different, a movable point. Here to stay at a fixed point. So the guiding principle of this talk is I'm going to try to concentrate. I want to avoid these terrible things. I want to understand what are the differential equations in the complex domains for which this kind of behavior does not happen. There are, I don't need to, to, to explain that in a moment. This is for the moment, just general principle. Let me begin by the, I'm going to tell you a long story which begins at the beginning of the 19th century. Let me begin by the first elementary situation in which it is well known that there is no terrible thing. It's the case of linear differential equations. It has been studied a lot. So you take an nth order differential equation, which is linear in the form that I wrote on the transparency. So the uh, coefficients ai of x are supposed to be rational functions of the parameter x. And you want to try to solve this differential equation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give, give me a moment. The first one, I, I, I gave three examples, okay? The first is, is not so terrible because it has a fixed singular point. The second is a bit terrible because it has a movable singularity, but has a right type. And the third is terrible because it has a movable singularity of non algebraic right type, okay? So it is a well-known fact in a calculus course, I, I don't know if it is taught here in this country, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, if you want to solve, <laughs> stop it, not sure. If you want to solve a linear differential equation, you can follow the solution given some initial conditions along any path. As soon as you avoid the critical points of the equation, which in that case are the poles of the AI. So it's a well-known fact. On, on the bottom I've drawn, um, this is the complex plane minus the singular points, which are the poles of the AIs. We take an initial condition x naught, we take an initial value y naught, y prime naught, and so, and so on. And the classical theorem says that you can follow in a unique way the solution along the path gamma until the end point of it. So this means that we, have, we do not encounter any kind of movable critical point for linear equations. If you open an old book, 
you will read it this way, linear differential equations have no movable critical points. This is the way our grandfathers and grandfathers used to think. Linear equations are nice from that point of view, no movable critical point. Of course, as the first example shows, you might have, in many cases, fixed critical points. So as a first example, you know, uh, uh, you, you, know you could, uh, since I allowed it from, you know, you could put a reading coefficient, which is, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So let me uh, focus uh, on a very important problem for the 19th century uh, in the linear case. So you start with the linear differential equation like this. You play the game I explained. If you take a path starting from the initial point, you can follow the solution in a unique way. But of course, what you want to do is to take a loop coming back to the original point, and since it's a linear equation, the system will have been modified by some matrix. And this gives you a classical object in mathematics, which is the monodromy representation, which is a homomorphism from pi 1 of the complex plane minus the poles to G, L, and C, which tells you how to modify the, uh, which measures the multi-valued property of the solutions. And a typical, very, very important problem in the 19th century has been the following. Try to determine all linear differential equations for which the solutions are algebraic functions. Take a linear differential equation. Solutions are multivalued, very complicated. Ask yourself, in which cases this monodromy representation is finite, meaning that the ramification is finite, meaning that the function is the solutions are multivalued but algebraic. So this problem has been a central problem during at least 100 years. All solutions are algebraic. You could ask many questions. One solution is right, and let's, for today, it's all solutions are right. So uh, let me give one example, which has been the, the, the typical example for, for, for more than 100 years, which is the hypergeometric equation. It's just an example of such a linear differential equation of the second order, which is written here. It's the simplest possible case for many reasons I don't have to determine now, which uh, depends on three parameters, A, B, C, which are three complex numbers. And here I put a few names, a few mathematicians, which spent some time on this question. Now, Euler invented this equation. Gauss, well, I'm not going to explain what they did, but all these guys, uh, Euler, Gauss, Lejean, Rabel, Jacobi, Kummer, Riemann, Fuchs, Schwarz, Frobenius, Klein, Jordan, and so on, all these guys, try to solve this solution, this question. For which value of A, B, C is it true that the solutions are algebraic functions? In other words, for which value of A, B, C is it true that the monogamy group is finite? Yeah. Yeah. Is it clear that? Yeah. Yeah. It is clear for you. <laughs> <laughs> you know that. It is clear for you, uh, it, it was not clear at that time, but uh, it is not completely clear. So it turns out that in this case, after doing some work, you can explicitly write down the monodromy representation, the image of each generator as a function of ABC, and you can explicitly find the list of all finite subgroups of GL2C, which now all students know, and uh, you can explicitly write the equations on ABC in such a way that the monodromy group is finite. You get e equations with integral coefficients, you solve them, and you find 15 cases. There are 15 explicit triples of ABCs 
for which uh, these solutions are algebraic. And these 15 cases are very related to the polyhedron and the finite subgroup, uh, the platonic polyhedron and the finite subgroup of SL2C. Uh, of course, I have no time to get to give more details, but I just want to tell you that this problem, even though it looks very particular, has been very, uh, uh, very important for mathematics because due to this, we developed the theory of finite linear groups, the theory of groups, the theory of uh, flat connections, the theory of everything. This is the heart of mathematics in the, in the 19th century. Excuse me, I cannot read the coefficient for y prime. For what? What is the coefficient of y prime? It's, it's a linear function. Okay. C minus a plus b plus 1 times x times y prime. This is the this is a question of, of notation, which has, this is the standard choice of, uh, this is the notation of Riemann. Riemann was using alpha, beta, gamma. <laughs> okay, so this problem is kind of solved. We understand linear equations, so to speak. Um, are there other equations with the same property that they don't have any movable physical points. Are there non-linear equations? Can we go beyond? Does there exist non-linear differential equations having the same property that they do not have movable critical points? Here I just modified, the, I just want, I don't want to, 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 to stick to a very precise definition. So here I am loaded I am allowing uh, poles. Pole for, a pole for a function is not a singularity. We, we, all of us will agree that 1 over x is not singular at 0. 1 over root of x is singular. But 1 over x. This is a matter of definition. But let us, go, let us de decide today that poles are not considered as being singularities. Now question. Beyond linear equations, are there examples for which there is no movable critical point? There is a very famous example, Riccati equations. Riccati equations, so now we are back to the 17th century. Riccati equations are equations like that. Y prime is equal to blah, blah, blah. And the important thing is that the second uh, member is a polynomial in Y of the second degree. What I'm going to say would not be true for third degree, second degree. And it turns out that these equations have the same property, that they have no movable critical points. But this is cheating, because as, as I wrote here, Riccati, lin Riccati differential equations are somehow linear differential equations. So somehow this is, a new, this is not a new example. So let me explain why this polynomial of the second degree is linear. <coughs> this is very simple and very well known. If you start with a differentially linear differential equation of second order, like that, and if you define u to be the logarithmic derivative of the solution y, it turns out that u satisfies the Riccati differential equation. And conversely, if you give me a Riccati differential equation, I can, cook a, I can produce a linear differential equation such that uh, uh, u is blah, blah, blah. So they are exactly the same objects. So the picture here, is a picture that shows you the dynamics, so to speak, of a Riccati differential equation. Here, on the basis, you have the line x with a few singular points, which are the poles of the equations. They are fixed independent of the solution. But over there, over each point x, I have drawn the projective line C union infinity. And the nice feature of the Riccati differential equation, being of the second degree in y, is that when you write the equation in this compactified space, adding the line at infinity y is equal to infinity, the corresponding foliation that you get 
on this object is transversal to the fibers everywhere except on those fibers which correspond to the critical points. And this is the explanation why it is possible to move from one point to another one without any creation of any movable singularity. So this picture shows that the Cathy differential equations are free of movable singularity and really they are linear equations so you should not be happy with these examples they are here linear equations are there others are there differential equations for which there is no movable critical point well let me show you one example there is famous example of differential equation of the first degree first order for which there is no critical point, no movable critical point. Well, the Weierstrass equation. If you write the differential equation, dy dx squared is equal to this cubic polynomial in y, well, the solutions are the Weierstrass functions, p, the, p, the elliptic functions, p of x minus a constant. And Consequently, they have no singular points. The only singular point would be the poles of the, of, of the elliptic function. The poles we decided that they are not singular points. Now, if you take uh, uh, a very famous book by Brio and Bouquet uh, on elliptic functions, 1875, you can see that they build the full theory of elliptic functions from that point of view. In other words, they start with this differential equation and they define an elliptic function as being a solution of this differential equation. And then they start the theory, blah, 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 periodicity, double periodicity, and so on, from that starting point. So we have to come back to their way of thinking at the time. At the time, they were thinking in the following way. They were looking for nice differential equations producing new transcendental functions. So they were thinking of differential equations as being a way of producing interesting transcendental functions that might be interesting for analysis. So from that point of view, one could consider that the Weierstrass equation is uh, uh, at the birth of elliptic functions. And this, what? As you know, Adrian, Adrian. Okay. Are there more functions? I mean, are there more differential equations this, this, this besides the linear ones or, or the, the Cathy? and elliptic functions, are there more without critical points? Movable critical points? No. This is a nice theorem of Poincaré. Let me write down this theorem. Theorem of Poincaré, at the end of the last century, you consider a differential equation, <coughs> polynomial differential equation, like that, f of x, y, y prime is equal to zero, and you say, well, assume that there is no movable critical point. So you assume that along any path, you can follow the solution in a meromorphic way. Maybe some pose, sometime, but no, no critical point. And the theorem says that either your equation is a Riccati equation, or it is solved by elliptic functions, or it is a, a, has, it is a Silly equation with, with all those whose solutions are algebraic functions. So there is no new example. So let me give you a proof of this. Nice proof, like many proofs of what I know. Proof is this. Just what a picture. What? what? The linear oh, oh, I should have said, I should have said, and this x, y, y prime is a uh, uh, is, is, uh, first order. First order, first order. 
Yeah, I'm going to the second order in a moment. So let me show you the proof of Poincaré, nice proof. Few lines. For each x, you consider the curve, the Riemann surface, the algebraic right curve, defined by f of x y y prime is equal to zero. Okay. So for each point x, you have a Riemann surface. So this gives you kind of a bundle, a Riemann surface here, over each x. Maybe this, what? It's a polynomial. I said a polynomial. So you get a bundle of Riemann surfaces. Maybe it's some singular points, but let's avoid them. And what is the assumption? The assumption is that given a path in the base, you can follow the differential equation along this path. This means that any path joining two points in the base will provide you with an isomorphism between the two corresponding Riemann surfaces. In particular, they are all isomorphic. In particular, all Riemann surfaces in this bundle are the same as holomorphic objects. Because you can go holomorphically from one to the second by assumption. Now you look at three possibilities. The Riemann surface might be a CP1, Riemann sphere. Then the monomy sits inside the automorphism group of CP1, which is PGL2C. This is a Cartier equation. Second case is it might be an elliptic curve, always the same elliptic curve. Then the solution is defined by elliptic functions. And the last case is that the fiber might be of higher genus. But everybody knows in Poincaré in particular <laughs> that automorphism group of a Riemann surface of higher genus is a finite group. So this means that the monogamy is a finite group. Solutions are algebraic functions. This is the proof of Poincaré. So there is no hope of finding anything new, any new transcendental functions from this procedure. Unless, unless, as uh, Jean-Christophe was saying, unless you go to second order of differential equations. So let's try to do that. So the guy who did it was Panevé. Panevé attacked this problem in the early uh, <coughs> beginning of the, of the 20th century. He wanted to look at this differential equations of the second order. So he looked at this kind of equation, y double prime is, let's say, a polynomial, x, y, y prime. He, he took the simplest possibility, a differential equation which is solved in, in the first variable. And he, he was looking for polynomials r such that there is no movable singularity. He did, he did a lot of computations. And he, he ended with a wonderful theorem, which uh, uh, it seems to me has been essentially forgotten. And I want to recall it. Uh, please don't be afraid by this transparency. Here it is. The theorem is that you get six examples, six new examples of differential equations of the second order without movable critical points. These six new examples, besides uh, Riccati and uh, elliptic functions, these new examples are really new in the sense that we can prove that the solution cannot be expressed by solutions of linear equations of blah, blah, blah. They are really new, new transcendental functions. And you have six of them. Uh, please look only at the first one. You can remember it, but have a look at the last one. Uh, it's uh, rather complicated, but uh, you notice at least that it is a polynomial in the second degree in y prime. Always the okay. case. So these are new equations that come from nowhere. 
So uh, uh, Poincaré is report, uh, has said, I don't know if this is true or not, but Poincaré has said, these six equations are like islands in the middle of the ocean, far away from the continent of analysis. <laughs> he was wrong. He was wrong because it turns out, I have no time to explain that today, but it turns out that big six transcendental functions, six families of functions, they come from everywhere in mathematics today. You find them in, uh, in mathematical physics, you find them in uh, uh, isomonodromic deformations, they, they, they are everywhere, they are everywhere. So, uh, the bad point about this theory is that I wish I could understand the proof. <laughs> uh, the proof is terrible, terrible. Uh, really, I think we need somebody to make it simpler. Uh, I, I don't know any, any sim I, mean, I don't, I didn't see any simply new paper explaining it. If you want to see the proof, you just have to go to Palave and maybe to Inche or some old books. And there is no, no geometry in it. This is, this is a lot of computations. The only thing I can explain to you is one, one important tool. This is the only thing I understand in the proof. It is uh, just a, 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 a way of producing a necessary condition. The tool is this. If you have a, a, a differential equation like that, y double prime blah blah blah, depending on a parameter alpha, and suppose that you establish by some reason that for alpha different from zero, this equation has no movable critical point. Then you can go to the limit and R0 also has the same problem. This is not, not difficult to establish. So the set of those nice equations is closed. Then you use that to, to play the many games of renormalization. Like a typical example is this. You change variable like that. X is equal to X0 plus alpha X. Y is equal to alpha Y. You replace the new coordinates in the, the equation. You get a new equation which makes sense only when alpha is not zero, of course. But <coughs> you go to the limit and you get a, what, what, uh, you get a differential equation, which is R0, that uh, Palleve used to call the simplified equation. And if the original equation has no movable critical point, then the simplified equation also has no movable critical point. And using this trick, you can easily prove at least what I told you, that the equation has to be a polynomial in y prime of second degree. This block I understand. And then you start with maybe 50 or 60 pages of awful computations trying to extract necessary conditions. And I'm not speaking of the converse, showing that indeed the equation I wrote does indeed have this property. And I'm not speaking also of the theorem, which is very, very hard to show that the solutions of these equations are really not related to linear, to Riccati equations or elliptic functions. It might be the case that these equations might be reduced from other equations, but this is not. But this is much harder. So really, if somebody wants to do something useful, uh, <laughs> explain that to me. OK, so that was. <coughs> 1912 or something. So let me uh, jump uh, 70 years or 80 years. And now, uh, before I go to the work of Adolfo Guillo, which will be the end of the talk, I want to describe quickly the, wor the work of uh, another former student of mine, which who is somewhere here on the Bello, Julio, not here. Okay. Um, I want, you know, all the questions I just mentioned now are global questions. You have a polynomial, you want to solve this differential equation, and you ask global questions about singularities and so on. Let me try to concentrate on local questions. Let me give one example. There is a very simple example to motivate uh, the construction which follows. 
suppose we consider the, the vector field on the line, which is x cubed dx. And suppose you restrict, I, don't, I want to do something very local, so restrict this vector field to some open disk, unit disk. And you only look at this vector field in the unit disk. And let's, let us try to do some computation together. Let me try to find the flow of this equation, of this vector field. Of this. Let me try to find the local flow of this vector field. So I have to solve the differential equation dx dt is what is x cubed. So this means dx divided by x cubed is dt, calculus class. Integrating, you get this. So you get two formulas. You get the formula which gives you the position two useful formula. The first one, the second one, let's say. The second one gives you the position of the point x after time t. And you'll see something interesting happens. The local flow ramifies. There is a ramification in the flow. And there is something even stranger. Suppose, so this is the unit disk. In the unit disk, Consider two opposite points, x and minus x. <coughs> they are in the same orbits because this is one dimensional. So this vector field has two orbits, the origin, which is a fixed point, and, and the rest of the disk, which is an, uh, an orbit. Let me ask you the question, how long does it take to go from x to minus x using the flow? So I, I put in my first formula, x0 is x and x1 is minus x and I get t is equal to 0. So in 0 seconds I went from one point to some opposite point. So this is contradiction. So you see there is a contradiction in the existence of the local flow and this contradiction is localized in many neighborhoods of the, of the, of the singular point. I'm going to say that better in a moment. Well, you know, it is easy to see that the vector field x cubed ddx is not a complete vector field yep. because it blows up. But usually when one says that this is not a complete vector field, one thinks that this is not complete because it goes to infinity in finite time. My point here is that you have a, an abstraction to completeness in any neighborhood of the identity of zero. So, let me give, let me make that formal. Formal definition will be this one. So formal definition of uh, Julio is this. Suppose you have a holomorphic vector field in some open set in Cn. In a moment, it will be a very small open set, a small ball. Julio says that this vector field is semi-complete if the following does not happen. It is not possible to find the path in the open set connecting two different points tangent to the orbits of the vector field in such a way that the time you need to go from the origin to the end point is zero. In other words, in such a way that the integral of dt along gamma is zero. You know, if you take any vector field, it has orbits, even if it's not complete. And along the orbits, you have a natural differential form, which is dt, how long it takes to move a little bit. So if you take any compact arc along such an orbit, you can integrate the differential form dt. It gives you the time re requested to go from there to there. If you get zero, we get some kind of in internal contradiction to the existence of the flow. If this happens, you say this is not semi-complete. So there is some local obstruction of completeness. Of course, this notion is very good because if you restrict something which is semi-complete to some smaller open set, it is still semi-complete. So it makes sense to speak of a germ which is semi-complete. Okay. 
So you see, this definition is good, I think, because it's related to this non-existent, it somehow, it says the flow, the local flow does not ramify locally <coughs> in any neighborhood of the single okay. And now the kind of question I want to... Yep. Complex, yeah, yeah, right? you, you are too modern. I mean, you're thinking like in the 19th century. <laughs> uh, vector field is a, uh, as a vector field. <laughs> it's a section of the holomorphic tension. It's something. <laughs> For each point, you have a complex vector. Each point, you have a. Yeah, so it's a two. Yes, two real vectors. This is one. Yeah. Any, anyone? They commute. So it's, it, it defines a, a two-dimensional foliation issue. In this open set. Look at it in terms of foliation. Yeah. So you see, in this picture, U is the ball, the green ball. And this surface I draw with some handles is, an ob is a leaf of the foliation. So it's a two-dimensional object. In this leaf, on that leaf, there is a differential form, a holomorphic differential form, that you might call Vt. It is the form which is one on the, on the vector field. This is the form which tells you how long it takes to move a little bit. This is the dual form to the vector field. If now you give me in this surface with boundary, if you give me an arc, you can integrate. Yeah. What I say is that you have, a, you have a foliation. On the leaves, you have a canonical holomorphic one form. That's the structure. Yeah. And then you say it's not semi complete if you can find an arc for which the integral is zero. Example x cubed ddx is not semi complete. So, some examples. X cube is not. Same proof, X n d x is not semi complete. Where n is bigger than 2. Of course, if you have a complete vector field, it is semi complete. By definition. So if you restrict a complete vector field to some open set, it is semi complete. So for example, X d x and X squared d Complete means generates a flow, a global flow, a complex flow, an action of C, an action of C. I am embedded in the complex world. You know, flow means action of C. So, for example, x dx and x squared dx are semi-complete because they are the germs. No, no, it's a local motion. For com to be complete is global, but the re Okay, but the restriction of a complete vector field from open set is semi complete. So x dx and x squared dx are semi complete because they are the restrictions of global vector fields on CP1, which are complete. Okay. So these are uh, simple examples. So let me give uh, two theorems of uh, Julium. Which generalize, so to speak, the what I explain with the XQ. Let's go one dimension higher. Take a vector a holomorphic vector field in C2, having an isolated singularity at the origin. The theorem says that if you want this holomorphic vector field to be semi-complete, you have a necessary condition, which is that the second jet at the origin cannot be zero. The second derivative of the vector field cannot be zero. If a vector field is too degenerate, it is not semi-complete. Corollary, just an example of the corollary, it tells you that if you have a holomorphic vector field 
on a compact manifold, one dimension two. Then it is complete. And then this shows that its singular points are very special. If you take a holomorphic vector field on a complex compact manifold, its singular points have to have this very special property of non-ramification of the local flow, which is kind of analogous to the Pandelier property. So we can try to do as much as you can, uh, which is, uh, uh, you can try to mimic what uh, Pandelier did. Can we get classifications? So, I am thinking holomorphically right now. Everything is complex. The real world does not exist. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how I I am going to speak dimension 3 in a moment. Uh, I, this statement is probably true in higher dimension. I don't know what to call <laughs> Okay. Which okay. Which This is not known to This is not known. Yeah, what, what are the compact surfaces having? non-trivial holomorphic uh, vector field is still an open question in the case of uh, step class 7. Uh, it's not, it's not new. I, I agree with you that most complex surfaces have no holomorphic vector field. But this is the prototype of a theorem which could be generalized in higher dimension. OK, let me give you a, a more precise theorem that I got with uh, Julio. It's much better than that. If you take a holomorphic vector field in C2 with an isolated singularity, if it, you assume it is semi-complete, then you can say what it is. It is one of these four possibilities. Notice that each one is a quadratic vector field, homogeneous quadratic vector field. There are only four possibilities for uh, semi-complete vector field in C2. This is my theorem. The bad point is that, unfortunately, the dynamics of this kind of example is not very interesting. They have first integrals. And for example, if you take the first one, uh, its orbits are just elliptic curves. Uh, it's, it's not fun. It's a very poor dynamical system from the uh, dynamical point of view. It's not, 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 not interesting. They are not complete. Because this, the, the, the orbits are elliptic curves with some points at infinity. So some points are missing, are missing. But these vector fields are not complete. But somehow this is a complete answer that I, in my, in my, in my uh, idea is kind of analogous to the Pandelier classification. We want to understand which are the good vector fields without too much ramification. Okay. So I just keep one. Time to fast. What about higher dimension? Let us go to dimension three. Dimension three, uh, I came across by chance to a very wonderful example, which, uh, I'm sorry, we go back to 19th century. Uh, Halfen, in 1881, I have no idea why he looked at this example, but he did it. He looked at this differential equation in C3. So, in order to write it in a nice way, instead of, of giving you dx dt, dy dt, dz dt, I gave you dx plus y dt, and so on, uh, you can easily find the, the formula. So, it, it, the, the, the formula is nice. d of x plus y dt is x, y, and so on. And what what uh, uh, Halfen did is that he solved it. He solved this differential equation explicitly using logarithmic derivatives of theta functions of Jacobs. He was happy with that, always in the same spirit. He could solve the differential equation with the uh, tool of transcendental functions that he had in stock. And he also noticed he didn't say it this way, but of course, he noticed some kind of SL2C symmetry. Let me explain that better. But before I do it, I show you 
that this vector field of Halfen is really interesting from the dynamical point of view. And I show you what uh, Halfen did, but I prefer to present it the way uh, Adolfo Guillo revisited it. Here is the dynamics of this vector field. First, this is a vector field in C3. Okay. First of all, it is easy to see that three planes, the plane x is equal to y, y is equal to z, z is equal to x, each one of these three planes are invariant. And the dynamics on these three planes is not very interesting. But what we really want to understand is what's happening outside these three planes. And the picture is this. First, two notation. Gamma 2 is a second converse group, the group of matrices in PSL2z, which are equal to the identity mod 2. And omega is an open set in PSL2c. Which open set? is the open set of those matrices which map the point i in the upper half space in the upper half space. So it's an open set in PSL2C. Now, you consider the object that I like very much. You consider the quotient PSL2C modulo gamma 2. It's a complex three-dimensional manifold, very nice one on which we have dynamical systems, like, for example, the horocyclic flow, the complex horocyclic flow. This is a flow which acts on matrices by right multiplications by upper triangular matrices like that. This is a flow, complete flow. But now, in SL2C modulo gamma 2, you have an open set. Which one? Omega divided by gamma 2. <coughs> Omega divided by gamma 2 is not invariant by the flow. So you have a complete flow acting in a manifold and an open setting which is not invariant by the flow. But in any case, you can restrict the flow to this open set. You get something which is not complete, which is semi-complete. The theorem of Alphen and Guillaume is that what you really get is this vector field I mentioned. So the vector field I mentioned here on this uh, transparency, the dynamics of it here, the dynamics of this example is conjugate to this dynamics of PSL2C of omega modulo gamma 2. And most of you know in this uh, room that SL2C modulo gamma 2 act, action of horocyclic flow and so on, it's a very rich dynamical system, like ergodicity and blah, 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 and many things. So you can transport the information that you know how it is flow, and you get as a corollary that this vector field has a huge quantity of ergodic properties. Now, the point would be, yeah, 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 the same orbit structure. This is the same orbit, the orbit of the thing. <coughs> No, not in that case. You're right. Okay. The omega modulo gamma 2, by what I said, is C3 minus 3 planes. Which is not obvious a priori. Okay. So let me, let me tell you uh, very quickly how one could guess with modern terminology, how one could guess these examples of Alphen, how, how Alphen could imagine that these examples might be interesting. Well, this is very, uh, uh, if you do it in the right way, it's obvious. You have three vector fields in C3. The first one is the radial one. X D D X plus Y D D Y plus Z D D D Z. Second one is like a constant vector field with no singularity. It's a, 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 a constant vector field in C3. And for the third one, you take a quadratic vector field, anyway. Then you notice that the homogeneity of, of H, quadratic vector field, means that the bracket of R and H is, I, is H. This is the so-called Euler identity, the radial vector field 
bracket with a quadratic vector field, equal to the quadratic vector field. Now, since C is a constant vector field, it's a homogeneous vector field of degree zero, so it satisfies a bracket relation R C is minus C. So you have the beginning of a Lie algebra. Three vectors, R, C, H, two good relations. So you would ask, under which condition on the quadratic vector field do I have the third relation of SL to C? So I want to impose the condition that the bracket of C and H is R. This is an equation on the quadratic vector field. And you do it, and you find alpha equation. Actually, you find something a little bit more general. You get a family of differential equations, here they are, which depend on three parameters. So these three vector fields, these vector fields are the only vector fields which together with the radial and the constant ones generate their centers. And we all proved that in this family with three parameters, you have a discrete collection for which they are semi-complete. And the proof of that, I have no time to explain it, but the proof is very close to the original proof of Schwartz of the classification of those hypergeometric equations having um, algebraic solutions. So let me finish uh, very uh, quickly. Uh, by the following. We have examples. I think nice examples, rich dynamics of vector fields in dimension three, which have uh, this uh, semi-complete property. The question is, are there others? Can we get a complete list of uh, semi-complete vector fields? And the theorem that uh, Adolfo got, so I put it in quotes because I'm not, I want to check it first. The theorem is that Halfin's examples are the only examples of semi-complete vector fields in C3 with a finite number of possible exceptions. This finite number is less than 500,000. <laughs> I'm going to explain to you quickly why this 500,000. Uh, probably this is zero. Uh, uh, the, the, the proof is this. Uh, the general approach is this. Uh, if you have a, a quadratic vector field in C3, typically it has seven invariant lines. <coughs> if you projectify the vector field on, on the projective plane, this means you have seven singular points for the corresponding foliation. At each singular point, you have two eigenvalues. So this means that if you take a quadratic vector field in C3, quadratic vector field in C3 gives you seven pairs of complex numbers. The space of quadratic vector field in C3 has dimension 18. But you can change coordinates. It's an action of GL3, dimension 9. So you expect nine dimensions for the modelized space. Pairs, seven pairs of numbers, it's dimension 14. So you expect five relations among them. And the nice fact is that if the vector field is semi-complete, it is easy to see using this uh, standard V method, it is easy to see that these numbers have to be integers. So what you really have is to solve very complicated equation, polynomial equations in integral coefficients. And these equations are not so hard. But uh, let me give uh, example, uh, examples of equations that you get. You have to solve these kind of equations in integral coefficients. At first I said, well, just put that on the computer, no problem. But let me show you something. Let us look for seven positive integers such that the sum of the inverses is equal to one. This is a simple problem, finite number of solutions. 
number of solutions is huge, more than 500,000. So we cannot, so he has only a theory besides that finite number of counter examples. The number of seven tuples of integers for which the sum of the, in, the inverses is equal to one is huge. This is only first equation, but he should put the two on the computer as you get already. The computer worked three weeks, and he was giving solutions, solutions, solutions. We have to push the stop button. It's too many solutions. Okay. Okay. So let me stop here. I'm sorry to be a bit late. Uh, uh, so uh, the, the thing is not completely finished. Uh, I, I do hope we can understand the structure of a sem of semi complete vector field in C3, and then the next step would be to understand what's happening in higher dimension, and also the next step would be to understand what's happening in a, in a non-homogeneous case. And there are many things to do. And, uh, uh, surfaces is easy because by just by genus. For uh, complex surfaces, more complicated, you have general type and blah 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 and all this Kodaira classification. It is true that at the time of Panoje this, class, this classification did not exist. So maybe it's possible to restart the classification of Panoje using this kind of uh, idea. But uh, this has not been done. You know there are many 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 complex surfaces. Many. More than a human surface. <coughs> is there a... No, 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 not you. <laughs> <laughs> is there a place between uh, amount of P1 to V6? Uh, no, uh, oh yeah, yeah. Are, are the P1 and P6 somehow related? Yes. Uh, it, it turns out that there is a, what's called a confluence. If you take uh, if you change parameter in one differential equation, uh, it could uh, and you let parameter go to zero, uh, uh, you could get uh, uh, family of differential equation could degenerate to another differential equation, and the sixth value the sixth degenerates on fourth and third, value the four degenerates on value the two, and value the two degenerates on value the one. So there's a full structure. So the, the, the most complicated, the sixth one, which contains, so to speak, uh, all the others. But the sixth is so complicated that I prefer to think only of the first one. Not know about uh, uh, 
function. And I can tell you what it is. This guy was looking at space times, satisfying the Einstein equation. And a simple model would be you take a, a homogeneous uh, Riemannian three manifold, homogeneous Riemannian three manifold, and you let it evolve by uh, by, by by time. And then uh, you have uh, essentially three numbers to characterize uh, the homogeneous three-dimensional manifold that depend on three parameters. And then you look at the uh, Einstein equation to see what does that mean for such a space-time to satisfy Einstein equation. So it means that this homogeneous three-manifold has to evolve according to some ODE in R3. This is different. 